Welcome to Lecture 4 uh, of English and Women's Studies 3073. Um, for this lesson, we're going to be covering two autobiographical works, the works of Margaret Fuller and Harriet Jacobs, two very different people in some respects. But in many respects, there are some things in common. So we'll see if you can find some of those things. It'll be interesting to see if you guys can uh, can come up with a few things that they might have in common, even though they lived quite different lives. First, I want to talk up, talk a little bit about autobiography as a genre. It's really a very, very modern genre. Think about it for a minute. When someone tells you their life story, why do they do that? And why would you listen? Uh, well, they might do it because they felt that they had an, a life that was somewhat extraordinary and worthy of note, um, that people might be interested in it. Well, okay, then why would you want to read about it? Well, could be that you find it fascinating. It could be that you find it instructive. That's very important. A lot of people say, well, here's my life story. I'm a, I've been a very big success. I've gone from rags to riches, and you, here's how you can do that too. Uh, Benjamin Franklin did that um, quite effectively. But the autobiography as a genre sort of assumes in some ways that our lives are improvable right? That, that we can look at somebody else's life and be instructed by it, and that we can live a better life by learning from them. And you say, well, duh, no kidding, Sherlock. But um, honestly, the reason the autobiography is such a new genre within the last couple of hundred years or so is simply because prior to that, people didn't think that their lives could be improved very much. I mean, if you go back to the Middle Ages, for example, most people felt that if you were born a serf, you would be a serf forever. God made serfs, and he made kings, and he made a few people in between, and that's about it. You were born a serf, you're going to die a serf. If you were born a bricklayer, you were going to die a bricklayer. If your daddy was a bricklayer, you're going to be a brick. There was no sense of social mobility. There was no sense of economic mobility. There was no sense of educational improvement. There really wasn't even a notion of what we consider the modern concept of progress. Uh, people thought the, the world is the way it is, and it always will be, and that's just the way things are. And so the autobiography as a genre doesn't come about until the Enlightenment, because the, it's with the Enlightenment that we finally have this notion of progress in the modern sense, and the idea of mobility, right? I may start off as a kind of a, a, a penniless pauper, but I can become a, a, a wealthy business person. Okay, so the autobiography is is in, in most cases, if it other than its entertainment value, has at least some didactic function. I would argue, okay, uh, either explicitly or implicitly. <clears throat> that is, it's trying to teach people about how to live. Now, some of the traditions and subgenres that provide inspiration for this in the United States, in particular, when we saw Mary Rowlandson's story, okay, it wasn't a complete autobiography, it was more of a, a, a telling of a narrative of a particular episode in her life, so it wasn't her whole life story, um, but um, we saw what was called the captivity narrative, which is kind of a sub-genre of autobiography, if you will, where you talk about how, um, you know, you were, you were in, in most cases, it would be white or African-American individuals kidnapped by Native Americans, and they live to tell about it, and they give you all of the details, and uh, it's fascinating and exotic and strange and scary and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, and so what you find with Harriet Jacobs, who was an enslaved woman, uh, an African-American woman, um, uh, actually she was a mixed-race woman, uh, but she was enslaved, and what you find is that the, um, the captivity narrative of Native Americans capturing and kidnapping settlers is kind of uh, retreaded or reinvented for the purpose of describing her experience being enslaved, right? So hers is a captivity narrative too. It's a whole autobiography, but it's a captivity narrative too. So keep your eye on that and see what connections you can make between Rowlandson and Jacobs, because there are several there that are quite interesting. Um, now, how factual are these? Okay, well, how factual can any autobiography be? Nobody's totally objective about themselves. Even if you're pretty good at being able to figure out who you are and what you're like and all your foibles and flaws, you're not going to include everything that happened to you in your life. You're going to subjectively select the things that are most important to you. Oh, these are the important things that happened in my life. Somebody else might say, well, those aren't the important things. Here are the important things. You left out all this stuff. So, you know, 
we have this tendency to look at autobiography and even history as being this objective, scientific, you know, so-and-so. Even science isn't totally objective. I mean, the very decision that you want to study this as opposed to that, that you want to examine this or as opposed to that, that your hypothesis is this rather than that, all that's is a, is a subjective thing. Um, so, so how factual are these? Well, they're probably based in fact but each writer of one's own autobiography is going to taint it, or color it a little bit, right? Uh, particularly in the case of Harriet Jacobs, where there's a big controversy, as we'll see, Lydia Maria Childs um, um, was a, um, a, a sort of an amanuensis or possibly co-author of it. Okay, and of course that led, led to a lot of controversy. Well, you know, Harriet Jacobs didn't actually write it. Uh, Lydia Maria Childs actually wrote it, and so, um, you know, et cetera. But I, I happen to think that it was a, 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 I think it was a partnership. I think Jacobs' story is certainly absolutely credible and true, but did she write the way an educated, uh, upper class white lady from New England wrote? Probably not. And so she leaned on her heavily in terms of phrasing and organization of the text and things like that. So, so bear these kinds of things in mind uh, as we go forward. We're going to take a look here first at Margaret Fuller, and I'll give you a little background about Fuller. Fuller was, um, an extraordinary human being. She really was. Uh, we'll talk about that for a couple of minutes here. She was a member of the Transcendentalist writers in New England. These were a group of writers that included people like um, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry David Thoreau, um, uh, you know, all, all of these guys. Um, uh, you wouldn't count Nathaniel Hawthorne as a transcendentalist, but he used to hang out with them. Poe wasn't a transcendentalist, but he used to hang out with them. Um, and uh, you had quite a few writers of that, of that ilk up there in New England, specifically in the town of Concord. That's where many of them sort of put themselves. Um, Louisa May Alcott's father, Bronson Alcott, was a transcendentalist. Uh, there were just a number of different folks, and L Lydia Maria Childs was um, was associated with the transcendentalists a little bit on the younger side. So who was Margaret Fuller? Margaret Fuller's father was, as you can see from her autobiography, it's an excerpt from her autobiography uh, in, our, in our text. Father was a, um, a, um, a an attorney and was quite interested in I hate to say this this way, but it's really true. Using his daughter is kind of an experiment in a way. Um, wanted to know what could he do. Um, he was a little bit sure of himself. He felt people who were educators and teachers wasted a lot of time and piddle paddled around. And if you really took studying seriously and you were a really good taskmaster, your kid could learn three times as much in half the time. That was the kind of fellow he was. And to prove it, he was going to do it with his daughter. Okay. And so he gave her an incredibly rigorous educational experience. She details this. So rigorous, in fact, that the poor child had nightmares and didn't eat very well and suffered migraines and all kinds of things. Um, and she even says at one point, she says, as a lawyer, again, the ends constantly presented were to work for distinction in the community and for the means of supporting a family, to be an honored citizen and to have a home on earth were the great aims of existence. Her father really was not a very deep thinker or a spiritual person. He was all about well, I need to be a respected person in the community, and I need to have a nice home and provide for my family. He wasn't the kind of guy who went around thinking, what is the meaning of life, right? He didn't really ask those deeper questions. The reason he would have Margaret read literature was because that's what educated people did. They read literature. So she needs to have, she needs to check that box. I'm, I'm a very literate person. Okay, good. Uh, here's some art. Study it, memorize it, puke it back up on a test because you need to know art crap. Um, so he really wasn't somebody who took the studies to heart so much as it was somebody who trained her, and I mean trained her rigorously, as you can see, um, to open the deeper fountains of the soul, to regard life here as the prophetic entrance to immortality, to develop his spirit to perfection. Motives like these had never been suggested to him, either by fellow beings or outward circumstances. He just was not interested in that kind of stuff. Now, she comments uh, uh, in a section called overwork. I mean, if the whole section about her education is on overwork, there you go. There you got the whole thing there. Um, he made one great, great mistake, she says, her father. He thought to gain time by bringing forward the intellect as early as possible to make me study subjects beyond my age. I was often kept up till very late and he was a, a severe teacher. In other words, he made me study stuff at a very young age that I really wasn't kind of intellectually ready to study. So, you know, we're studying literature, and when you've had a few years under your belt, and you read a great poem that's about, oh, I don't know, you know, 
family problems, okay? Well, if you're pretty young, you haven't had a lot of family problems yet, so you can't really relate to it. You can't understand thoroughly and fully what the poet's getting at. And so to pull all that forward, you're just asking the kid to memorize junk. You, tra you, make, you make her into a trained monkey, frankly. Um, and what she's saying is, I was forced to study crud and not before I was able to fully appreciate it as an adult, as a young adult, right? So there aren't just things that you wouldn't have young kids exposed to because it's inappropriate. There are things you wouldn't have them study and read because it's just going to bounce off their thick little skulls. I hate to put it that way. Or they can't possibly understand it. I get angry when people have kids read Shakespeare too early. Um, Shakespeare's deep stuff, man. Shakespeare's about life. It's about the experiences in life. When you haven't had any life and you haven't had any experiences, put Shakespeare down go pick him up when you've had a little bit of time under your belt. You'll be able to fully appreciate it. It'll mean something to you. That's what she's getting at here. Um, so he was so intent on making her into this child prod prodigy, this miracle kid. Um, and part of that had to be ego. Okay, So she had to study all these different books. The one book that was kind of off-limits to her was, yes, indeed, she got, a little, got into a little trouble for reading Shakespeare, right? That wasn't very kosher. He didn't care for that very much. But she says, um, in commenting on some of this, she says, often since I have seen the same misunderstanding between parent and child, the parent thrusting the morale, the discipline of life upon the child when just engrossed by some game of real importance and great leadings to it. They, they push it too hard sometimes. Sometimes you have to let kids learn their own lessons. And what she learns out of much of this is that when she was allowed to read great literary works, when she was old enough to appreciate it, she fell in love with them. She actually adored them because she could, she could really relate to them at a certain point. Um, she says on page 117, certainly I do not wish that instead of these masters I had read baby books, right? I didn't want to read baby stuff um, written to, down to children. But I do wish that I had read no books at all till later, that I had lived with toys and played in the open air. Children should not cull the fruits of reflection and observation early, but expand in the sun and let thoughts come to them. They should not, through books, antedate their actual experiences. You shouldn't, don't have kids read about life, have them live it a little bit. And then when they read about it, it'll mean so much more to them because they'll say, yeah, that happened to me. I understand that person. That makes a lot of sense. I've always wondered that too. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah, that, I remember when I was a child, etc. If you don't let kids live, they have nothing to relate things in books to, right? Um, they should not, through books, antedate their actual experiences, but should take them gradually as sympathy and interpretation are needed. With me, much of the life was devoured in the bud. That's a sad line, isn't it? It's a really sad. I'm going to read it again. With me, right, like a rosebud, with me, much of life was devoured in the bud. In other words, much of life's great pleasure got destroyed in, with me in my childhood before I even had a chance to bloom. I was just a bud, and, and, and it stunted me as a person. Um, so the, the cons, right? <laughs> Lots. But the pros are this. Dad sure did create a brilliant person because she was unquestionably, in my mind, the most highly educated woman in North America during the 19th century. I don't think there's anybody that comes closer to her. Now, I won't say that she's the most genius person, but I will say that she was the best educated person. She knew more about more things than anything. And she was a lead uh, person when it came to um, the intellectual world of New England and of the United States at the time. She was the publisher of The Dial, which was the Transcendentalist magazine that was so, so influential. She almost killed herself doing it, too, by the way. Uh, it was just so much work. Um, it published all the great writers of the time. She, she kept that magazine alive. And up on your right-hand screen, she was a major, major important figure in the Seneca Falls uh, Women's Rights Convention in the 40s. Um, not because it was really important for her to have been there, but she, she laid the groundwork for that because a work that we're not reading for the class, I kind of wish we were, but it's really, really long. Her great work is Woman in the 19th Century, in which she really lays out um, the case for equality between the sexes. Now, of course, one of the things that she touches on in here briefly is friendship. 
and it's 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 really important to her because one of the things as you see through the text here is that she had this English lady a friend of hers who was an older girl and this happens a lot with girls I think when they're you know kids or tweens they look up to a, an older girl who's a teenager or maybe in her 20s and they just idolize them it's like I want to be just like her and you know everything about her is just the coolest um, and that was the case with this this young woman who befriended her and then moved away and it really left a huge hole in Fuller's life um, she gives her a bit of a token of their friendship as you can see in the text um, but that friendship and then the loss of that friendship prompts her to make one of the most profound observations on friendship. And I think you need to read this on your own a couple of times because it's so significant and so interesting. And if you've had different friendships and different types of friendships throughout your life, and we all have, I think, maybe this will ring true to you. I think it's so profound and thoughtful. And I don't think she would have had this epiphany about friendship without having gone through that and had that. And then not having many other friends, as she says later on. She says that the other girls kind of were polite to her, but they kind of didn't know how to play with her because of the, quote, peculiarity of my education, right? Um, they weren't mean to her. She wasn't mean to them. It's just they went out on the playground and Margaret was basically memorizing chemical formulas and, <laughs> and the other girls were playing hopscotch. It's like, okay, Margaret's a little different. Um, and she says, I, I really just couldn't relate to them very well because my upbringing was just so vastly different from theirs. The education of young women at the time was really just superficially really think of think of a girl just going through basically eighth grade just basic reading writing arithmetic and some literature then they would go on to do languages maybe if they were upper class as we talked about with charlotte rosen um languages and and um, music and needlework and stuff like that that largely fuller says uh, it's kind of a waste of time i mean how many how many sonatas do you need to play? Can't do that for a living. Um, but at the bottom of 120, she raises a really great um, point here about friendship. She says, <clears throat> in life, she says, we meet, at least those who are true to their instincts meet, a succession of persons through our lives, all of whom have some peculiar errand to us. They've got a purpose in our life, right? There is an outer circle whose existence we perceive, but with whom we stand in no real relation. They tell us the news. They act on us in the offices of society. They show us kindness and aversion, but their influence does not penetrate. We are nothing to them, nor they to us, except as a part of the world's furniture. This is the guy that I say hello to at the 7-Eleven when I go get gas in the morning. He's a nice man. I hardly know him. He doesn't know my name. I don't know his name. We're very polite to each other. We talk about the weather, and that's it, right? I mean, I, he doesn't want to get to know me. I don't really want to get to know him. I mean, I, I, I guess I would, but we just have, like, just a superficial, right, day-to-day uh, -day kind of existence. Then she says there's another circle, another level of friendship. Within this are dear and near to us. We know them and of what kind they are. They are to us not mere facts, but intelligible thoughts of the divine mind. Right, we can see their spiritual uh, um, essences. Right, we relate to them on a deeper level. They are not mere facts, but intelligible thoughts of the divine mind. We like to see how they are unfolded. We like to meet them and part from them. We like their action upon us and the pause that succeeds and enables us to appreciate its qualities. Often we leave them on our path and return no more, but we bear them in our memory tales which have been told and whose meaning has been felt. These are your really good friends, people who had friendships with you that were important enough that they changed who you were and you changed who they were. You had an influence in, on each other. You remember them forever. Even if you aren't with them anymore, even if they move away or you move away, you know them. You you will always say, oh yeah, that, that person was a really great person and, and I miss that person very much. And you had good, deep, long conversations with them about important things, not stupid stuff like, you know, whether the Cowboys won, which they don't. Um, and uh, instead, more of uh, like, what are your goals and plans and future and what do you think about life and how do you want to live your life? And, you know, um, those kinds of deep, deep, late night, I call them late night conversations that you have with your, you know what I'm talking about. All of you have had these and you've had friends that you could do that with as opposed to friends that, nah, I'm not close enough to do that with that person. And then though, she says, but yet a nearer group there are. 
beings born under the same star and bound with us in a common destiny. This is a third circle. They're even closer to us. These are not mere acquaintances, mere friends. But when we meet our sharers of our very existence, there is no separation. The same thought is given at the same moment to both. Indeed, it is born of the meeting and would not otherwise have been called into existence at all. These are not only these are the, these not only know themselves more, but are more for having met, and regions of their being which would else have lain laid sealed in cold obstruction burst into leaf and bloom and song. This is a level of friendship that she says goes beyond even good friend. This is someone whose very almost identity merges with your own. It's a closeness that. I mean, you almost are two halves of one whole. Now, notice she didn't say that this was necessarily a marriage partner, though it could be, right? I mean, you're instantly thinking, oh, soulmate, this is somebody I'm going to, you know, this is who you would marry. Well, in an ideal world, yeah, Fuller would say that, but it doesn't have to be. Um, Fuller didn't say in this passage that you had to be married to somebody like that. That could be somebody that, and she, and I think she means this English lady friend when she states this. I think she said, I grew so close with this this older girl, 20s, and I was a little kiddo, that we just, I mean, we were like two halves of one whole. And it doesn't have to be, it's not like romantic, right? Notice there's nothing romantic. It's spiritual. It's an intellectual and spiritual bond that she's describing here. And this is important because this is a person who really struggled with friendship for obvious reasons. So she's got a lot to say about it. And frankly, I think she's worth listening to. The final point on this, and then we'll go to our next video, is the text really raises questions about the education of women. Because she goes through all this, and then as an adult, she says, okay, so I have all this training and all this knowledge and all this education, and now they won't let me do anything for a living, right? I mean, the literary career, editing and writing, was about all she was allowed to do. She couldn't go out and become a captain of a boat or a, you know, a scientist. I mean, that was just not available. Later in the century, it was with Madame Curie and others. But for the most part, in the mid in the 1830s and 40s, she didn't have a shot at doing that at all, at all. Um, it's no coincidence that she joins Louisa May Alcott's father, Bronson Alcott, in his school, the Temple School in Boston, in trying to completely revolutionize education. She worked with him, and his whole premise was the foundation of modern education, even before Dewey or Montessori or anybody like that. Um, and the, um, the interesting thing is that um, she spends quite a bit of time with him experimenting about education with young children in an environment that is very different from her own because she wanted to see how would we do this and improve on what I experienced. It raises questions though. Her education was, it raises questions. You can prepare a woman like this, but then what do we do with them? What opportunities do they have? And the answer was for her generation, not many, sadly.